if you make the wrong call, you can't get an athlete back to, you know, if they're a starter and you can't get them back to sport, you better believe you're probably not getting picked up. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. Welcome all new listeners and welcome back to those who have heard my content in the past. I am pumped about this podcast. Uh, This is near and dear to my heart because I love this aspect of uh, the job, the role of being a sports PT, like what it really means to travel with athletes. And if you've ever um, had any interest in that or what it's like behind the scenes, this episode is perfect for you. All right, uh, before I get onto the podcast, uh, what is better in life? Uh, if uh, if any of you noticed, uh, I finally got my wife to do some content with me. It just took me a couple years and uh, she has agreed uh, more like volunteer and told, <laughs> uh, voluntold told to, to get in there with me. So um, I'm, we're having fun with it. Uh, more than anything else, we're, we're having a blast uh, just helping the community, other sports PTs. Uh, my wife, Stephanie, is a PTATC and uh, is an incredible clinician. And so uh, as a team, we balance each other out. So I'm excited to finally get her on some media. Uh, my kids are good. Uh, they're back in preschool and things are going great. Um, if you weren't on my email list, uh, join that now, drchrisgarcia.com forward slash mailing dash list. Uh, I sent an email this week about ankle sprains. So if you're interested in the content um, and it's just a lot of case studies that I uh, I share, uh, join it on the list. Uh, join me on my emails and uh, follow along. But anyways, uh, life is good. Life is good. Family's good. Uh, sports performance is good. Um, just trying to get everybody on the same page and uh, improving skill sets. That's kind of our focus right now at the moment. We've scheduled out, uh, I think, five CEU or content courses, or I don't know. We have a ton of them already happening. And then we have, uh, if you guys haven't uh, been part of it, uh, just put on your calendars March 12th and 13th of 2022, depending on when you're listening to this, uh, for our uh, Sports PT Accelerator course. Uh, it's a two day event. It's more of a retreat. If you want to hang out with me, uh, come over and uh, say hi. All right, on to the podcast. Let's talk about traveling. What does this mean? Let me give you some context uh, because I didn't start traveling um, until my second year as a physical therapist. Um, I'll give you the route. I'll tell you about some of the trips that I've done and what it was like behind the scenes and uh, in general, like why I continue doing it, why I'm no longer doing it (laughs) and uh, just the ins and outs. All right, so I'll set the stage. For those of you who know, I've done uh, a sports residency at The Ohio State University and uh, it was an absolute blast. While there, I got to hang out with uh, and and work with uh, uh, OSU's rugby team. It's a club team and we would travel to local states um, and uh, that would probably be the extent. We didn't really travel uh, too far away from like one or two states away. Uh, but it was great because we'd spend the weekend, uh, we'd depart on Friday, stay at the night hotel, train, uh, practice on Saturday, either stay one more night or come back depending on what it was. And that was my first exposure. Uh, and so I was a resident and I would go with a local uh, athletic trainer and they would show me the ins and the outs and we'd review it and you know what would happen, what type of injuries. And so as a resident, I learned a lot in terms of what is it that I need to be prepared for? Because that's big. That's probably the biggest thing there is uh, it's not like what you do is where you prepared to do it. And that that's probably the biggest challenge that you're going to have. And, you know, we would have to pack the med kit. We have to pack everything and everything ready to rock and roll. So from spine boards to the entire med kit to taping equipment to the table, I mean, just so much. And it was great to be over-prepared uh, than under-prepared. And so I learned that y- you got to bring everything. Uh, whatever you think you may never use, just bring it, just do it. I mean, AED everything as much as possible. And uh, that requires that, you know, whoever it is, the organization that you're with uh, has those supplies. So um, that was a great first learning experience. And I had a mentor, uh, an athletic trainer who was right beside me, who really showed me the ropes. And it was good, I think for a full year, uh, I got to travel with them and and experience all of that. Uh, And then uh, came the incredible, like, new opportunities and that was through the United States Olympic Committee. Uh, I worked for them for about three years and during that time I uh, traveled domestically and internationally and both had different backgrounds to them and uh, advantages and disadvantages to them Uh, and then from there and I'll tell you more about like the actual locations um, and then from there 
I worked um, NFL combine training, so that was more just locally. Uh, and then I had a unique experience to travel one-on-one -on -one with a professional tennis player for months in Europe and in the US. And that was very, very different. And, and I'll tell you uh, why in just a bit. So uh, let's talk about the uh, international trips uh, that I did with the United States, States Olympic Committee. They were amazing. And there's a big difference when you travel with a team versus an individual. Uh, and so I have uh, I have some things I want to share. So uh, the, the some of the greatest trips I've ever had were, one of them was to Lyon, France. And I got to travel with Paralympic track and field. And when you, when you work with Paralympic athletes, uh, you're dealing not just with yourself and them, but the equipment, <laughs> whether they're, you know, wheelchair bound or whatever it is, uh, throwing chairs. I mean, there's just a ton of equipment that you have to take with you. Um, and the preparation for Paralympics uh, might be a little different than able-bodied, but nonetheless, you're still doing the same thing. You're preparing for the worst and uh, you, you got to have all of that stuff with you. So uh, let's talk about um, what you have to bring, right? Just like imagine everything that is on your shoulders or hands while you travel. So first and foremost, you have this super heavy uh, uh, med kit. And in that med kit, you have uh, all your supplies. Uh, and then you might have a sling kit that you might have to like run on the field and, and do immediate coverage with. And that's just like your, you're more like, um, you know, uh, acute uh, skin or uh, band-aids or whatever it is that you need to be able to solve quickly uh, versus the kit might have stuff that you is you know that you're gonna have to deal with uh, on the sidelines or you have a little bit more time to manage so you have that heavy bag a sling kit uh, maybe your personal backpack because it has a lot of other things that are kind of important uh, and then then from there you have your massage table or treatment table and I also learned that when you are having a, a massage table, you kind of want to pick the one that's a little bit more uh, ergonomically designed for travel, and you don't want to have something that's super heavy. So most massage tables, I learned this, are about 35 pounds, like the wooden ones, the foldable treatment tables. And then you have these very light tables that run anywhere from 25 to 27 pounds. And you might think like 25 to 35 pounds, that's only 10 pounds, really. The trouble is, is that you're actually taking that table all over the place and you're carrying it for long distances sometimes. Maybe you're on a bus and you have, you're in a crammed area and you have to carry it and put it in between people and then you have to take that to a field and from the field you go to the hotel and from the hotel you go and you're just carrying this and, and you don't realize this but when you have a heavy med kit which is around 20 pounds, 18 to 20 pounds and then you have a heavy table, you're constantly offset. So if you have back pain as a clinician, it hurts. So you kind of have to think about that. So would I invest in a in a super light table? Yes. Uh, they'll run you about three times the amount, uh, but it's totally worth it. So uh, that is uh, the treatment table. That's everything that you're carrying. And don't forget, some of the stuff you're carrying onto the airplane with you. So uh, you, you got to have, you got to balance this out. And then is it going to fit in? And this is uh, before like... Um, before Uber and Lyft, this was uh, going into like taxis uh, when I was doing this. So would it fit in the back of the truck or in back of a truck or back of a taxi? Uh, these are all the small things that I didn't even think about, but actually it is a reality. Uh, and when you're carrying all these things, you have to know that you can't expect that the uh, athlete is going to help you because that's really your job. And it's a plus if they do. Uh, most of the time they're not because you think about this, they're prepping for a competition. They're not prepping to help you carry things. And that's the least of the concern for them. Their mind is on one thing and that's to win. And that's how you uh, keep your job. <laughs> you got to let, you got to help them win. <laughs> you got to keep them healthy. And so when you're traveling with them, you're outside your role in from, from that scope. Normally we're like, oh, well, we um, help them stretch and mobilize and move and do all this stuff. But now you're bringing the clinic with you. That's the biggest difference. Before you didn't, you had the clinic that was nice and stable. Now you're setting up a modified uh, clinic in a hotel room, and that's that's the common way to to manage it. So uh, I remember having to to set up a treatment table right next to a uh, bed, and we had I think we had like I don't know ten rugby players in the same room, all trying to figure out. Um, you know, how are we going to fit all of us in here because we need to be able to manage uh, space and some of them needed supplies. And we also used the hotel room as the main place where all their snacks were, um, where everything was held. That was the medical area, it was the massage area, it was 
all of us in the same room. And when you have that many people, uh, you, you got to be able to bring everything and then make sure that you don't forget it at the last place. So uh, when you're managing one or two tables, when you're managing a med kit, when you're managing supplies, and just remember, you kind of serve the role also of uh, making sure that they have all their their medications or um, all the snacks and all those things. Typically, you have a team with you, and if you don't, you are that provider. So you know if they get sick or if they have um, you know GI issues or whatever it is. Uh, if you have a team physician with you, that's great. You know they they'll usually pack that, but that's not always the case, and you have to be prepped with. Well, what happens in those events? Uh, you know, there's no easy answer to it, but you just have to know what might hit you uh, as you continue to travel and, and uh, manage athletes. So that's the uh, equipment part, right? So we had med kit, we got sling kit, we got backpack, we got table, always the lightest table, uh, invest in it, just makes sense. Uh, and uh, that, that's navigating taxis, uh, lifts, uh, Ubers, uh, airplanes and trains actually so that was an interesting one too so we would we would be taking all this equipment even on trains because we go city to city uh, if you're with a large organization or a team you might be taking a, a large bus or you might be taking an airplane but if you're traveling with a small team or a single person you're taking every part every type of uh, uh, transportation possible so I think when I did uh, tennis I did uh, we did taxis trains uh, cars, uh, airplane, buses, I mean, you name it, we did it. And uh, I would, I learned that packing less is better, <laughs> but unfortunately, uh, you can't, you kind of have to pack a little bit of everything. So does your back hurt? Yes. Does your neck hurt? Yes. Uh, is it part of it? Yes. Does it get better? Absolutely. You actually build a tolerance uh, for carrying that. And I imagine, you know, people who have to t carry, you know, backpacks or, you know, uh, rucksacks or whatever it is, y your neck and back kind of get, you know, used to it. It's not the most uh, fun thing. But as a clinician, if you have pre-existing conditions or pre-existing pains, be aware it's going to get heightened. And so uh, that for me was a good learning lesson. So uh, buy the lightest equipment and then also be aware if you have uh, stuff going on already, it might already... Um, uh, bring that out even more. So, uh, what was a daily schedule like? What it was it like? What 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 do you do? What's a a daily schedule? What's a weekly schedule? Uh, is it different from you know the competition day to pre competition day to a practice day? So, in the world of rugby, um, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about rugby. So, if we did rugby, we would have an event maybe on a Saturday morning, a sun, Saturday afternoon, a Sunday morning, and a Saturday or a Sunday after, e evening as well. So Monday through Friday was, you know, practice, get them all ready. Uh, Monday, they were pretty uh, banged up from, you know, the previous tournament. So Monday was recovery day. Uh, they're just doing a, a walkthrough session or a flush. And, and what I mean by that is they're usually just going through, you know, um, jogging drills, walkthroughs. They're not doing contact. Um, they're just doing a uh, review of plays, how the week go, because uh, they're all pretty banged up. So we do high recovery sessions then, massage, soft tissue, uh, corrective exercise, taping, you name it. Just literally put the band-aids on. <laughs> they're like a human band-aid. Just get them together and, and tape them up. And this is where I think a lot of orthopedic PTs have a challenge with managing the sports side of, uh, of rehab and traveling. Uh, this is where I noticed that and I was guilty of it myself, you know, even going through the residency, my intuition was, that, oh, you know what, uh, we should, you know, do exercises and, and do correctives. And I realized they were banged up and it was actually going to be counterproductive if I had, you know, increased their load or increased their volume of exercise or total movement. And all I did was then I said, okay, well, what can I do to maximize, maximize the recovery right now? Okay, so then we started looking at local pools. Can we get them in a pool? Because they still need to move. And, but their joints are pretty messed up. All right, let's get them in a pool. Is there a local sauna? Is there anything that we can do? We already we had recovery, um, you know, compression garments. So uh, all waking hours, they were in uh, tights that were built for you know um, vascular support. Uh, they would uh, work in, uh, or, or they would be in Normatec uh, on a regular basis. Uh, they would be supine feet elevated. Uh, we then got them in a pool, got them in a sauna, whatever we could do. If we can find a local acupuncturist, we had a, a massage therapist with us. So it, 
it was trying to figure out how do we maximize most recovery in a short period of time. And when you're in an orthopedic setting, this is not really a concern because you, some people don't even have timelines. Some people have a timeline, but it's like weeks out. But what if you have a timeline on like, I need to be ready in five days. You're, you're ready to throw everything in. This is the trouble that I see with orthopedic clinicians. Well, what do I do to get them five days better? I mean, well, I'll, I'll have them do exercise and soft tissue on Monday. Well, then what happens Tuesday? I don't know. Do I repeat the same? I mean, do I not do it? What, what's the best thing to do? And ultimately, you have to look at what's their practice schedule. And from there, you have to figure out, does does the does it match what their coach is going to do? And then they might have a strength coach that is right there with them, giving them exercise that, you know, on two days a week, they still have to do some strength training because in season, a lot of athletes will lose muscle mass. That is a problem. Well, well how does that affect anything? Power output. 100%. You need to have mass <laughs> and acceleration. So if you cannot, if you lose mass purely from being in season and training, I mean, that is going to affect your quality of output. So what we realized was we needed to maintain muscle mass during in season. So we would obviously help them. We had a nutritionist who was with us, uh, or if not, they were remote. Here's kind of the guidelines for nutrition. Here's what you're following. We had a strength coach. If they weren't with us, they were remote. Here's your program. I need three days or two days of lifting in between. You're not doing the day before comp, but you're doing it two days before comp. And as a clinician, all you're trying to do is like, okay, how can I fit what I need in between all of that to not overdo everything? Because they need to be able to lift and maintain muscle mass. They need to be able to eat properly. And the thing is, also, if they're injured or they're post-surgical, how do you account for that? So, uh, and if, are they a, a first, you know, first uh, string player? Are they going to start or can we hold them out? They don't have as much playing time. And that's the algorithm in your head that you're trying to figure out. Where does this player lie in priority and then also in severity? And once you have those two things, you kind of have to figure that out. And every clinician, the best thing you can do is be in communication with the coach. It's actually the easiest thing you can do. Hey coach, I'm new to this. Here's what I'm, I'm seeing down the line. Uh, you got three on the roster uh, that are hurt and we'd call it a green, yellow, or red light system. So are they good to go for this week? Still yellow light, I wouldn't go. Uh, they're a red light for Tuesday and Wednesday, still no go. They can't do any lower body pushing, uh, no weight room. I, it's gonna be better to maximize them. Uh, full recovery, Thursday we'll go in the gym again, Friday uh, in practice, and then you figure out, coach, if, if the, they can practice and they have enough conditioning and that you trust them to be able to go back in. And that's the kind of feedback you're doing, you're working with. And then you talk to the strength coach and you're working with a nutritionist. So even though you're far remote and you're working with a team, you can still have access to all that. And you're still trying to figure out how are you part of the equation? And so uh, what you're doing is you're ultimately filling the gaps. So, you know, Monday you might do soft tissue, get them in the pool, help them go through a workout. Tuesday, you're doing more corrective exercises. Uh, maybe, you know, just uh, primers to, you know, before the lift, uh, activation work, whatever it is, stretching. And then post-workout, what are you doing? I mean, you still got to be working on them because you're trying to expedite healing and you have all the hours in the day. And that's very different from the orthopedic setting. You'd literally have them, you know, probably 16 hours a day available to you. And three to four of those hours, they might be in a weight room slash gym. So that's 12 hours. And then they're probably eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They got nine available hours. So now you have nine available hours. How do you maximize recovery and nine hours? And actually, if they're, you know, having swelling issues, you should have a compression garment on at all times. They should be supine. So even when they're resting and everything else, they should do, be doing some form of recovery and nutritional support to support that. So, and hydration and all those things. And, and, it's incredible. Like if this fires you up, man, this is it's pretty cool. It's pretty amazing to, to be part of this. And all you're doing is you're just getting better at your equation on how do I maximize recovery? In the orthopedic setting, we're trying to figure out how do I get rid of their pain? In this side of the performance side and in sports, you're not trying to reduce pain. You're trying to minimize, mitigate pain. They're always going to be in pain. If you haven't heard my podcast in the past, Athletes will always be in pain. It's just how much and then what's the timeline I got to manage this in. And that changed my, that changed the game for me, like changed the game. Uh, and this is why, you know, if you guys are ever interested in, in any of my retreats, any of my courses, you got to come because it just, it changes the way you think. Pain 
will always be present. I'm sorry, like if you're a pain-free specialist, it will always be present. And when you're traveling with athletes, it's just a matter of the severity. It, can you play on this or not? Can we, do we need to skip this one? Do we need to hold you out for half the game? Can you play spurts of the game? Do you play the whole game? Those are the questions that are really going to arise. And that the pressure becomes on the medical staff because strength is, is, is st when you're in season, strength training takes a, a, a dip in priority. In the off season, strength training, high, they are highest priority. And then coaching is, you know, preseason. Coaching in season is heavy priority. Strength coach falls down in priority. Medical staff based on severity of injury and timing. And when you learn that, the pressure's on you. And you're not used to making game, game time decisions. Because in an orthopedic clinic, who are you responding to? I mean, maybe the athlete, maybe the parent, maybe the physician um, is asking you. But there's not a lot of urgency most of the time. Unless you work with high schoolers, community athletes. Uh, maybe you have a couple of pro athletes on your table. And when you have timelines like this, it's incredible. The pressure is on, but you make a right decision. Uh, you, you'll get more pro athletes on your table. Uh, and the first couple times that I made decisions, I, I was very hesitant, but I knew that uh, people have asked me before, how do you know if if you're making the right decision? All right. So you have your skill set and education that you've built up, you've put a lot of time, effort, and money into, right? You have your education, right? And then you have your life experience, uh, the things that you've learned and experienced in life, right? And then you have education. So somewhere in the world in between that is intuition of, is this the right thing? That's all you can do. And, and to this day, if an athlete comes on my table, you better believe I'm going to use both of those. And, and some would say, well, that's the science and the art. Uh, sure. Sounds good, but I'm just saying there has to be a form of intuition in there. And I think if you're too heavy science, you're going to lose touch with reality. You're like, you're like, well, I don't even want to have him walk because there's no science behind why, uh, walking. <laughs> but if somebody says, okay, well, then I want you to do aura treatment and, and you know, stuff that maybe not might not be appropriate for like expediting healing right there and then. So somewhere in between lies this art, this intuition of what do you do next? And if you don't have enough experience in the back behind your behind the scenes, that's going to your intuition is only going to be limited to like that type of environment. So in the acute acute management world, the residency really set me up for that. Uh, you know, working with rugby because that's high trauma. And then Work, I worked with uh, USA BMX and BMX, I mean, there's trauma all the time and working with other individuals, me medical healthcare providers, physicians, other athletic trainers, learning from them while acute trauma is happening. I mean, that's, that's so rare. And when you hit those, when, when you get those emergency trauma situations, and I'll do another podcast on this, another topic uh, just for emergency medicine, but emergency medicine prepares you mentally because it gives you a, a, a different part of the spectrum. If you've heard my spectrum on how to manage athletes, true athletes, not just like the, you know, uh, come in once a week type of athlete, but like across a year, you're going to get times where they have acute injuries and you got to be able to manage that in the short timeline. So you have the acute care management, you have the normal like six week to three month orthopedic pain type of a management, and then you have strength and conditioning. And the way you can see that is uh, off season, they're just strength training. How do you help them? Preseason, they're banged up here and there. And that's like corrective exercises and whatever it is. And then you have in season. When you're in season, different ball game. Different ball game. Because you don't have time for one time a week for six weeks. Or three to ten repetitions of clamshells. Not possible. Why? Because they gotta be able to play on Saturday. That's not going to help them play. That's just going to help them feel a little bit more stable and a little bit more balanced. But ultimately, what are you doing to expedite their healing? that they're strong, they feel appropriate, and they're confident to return to sport. So when you have uh, preseason, in season, and uh, out of season, when you can manage a person throughout that whole spectrum, that's when you can truly understand the full gamut of how to manage somebody. And so when I was traveling with these individuals, it really helped me understand the acute care management. It helped me understand the psychology of sport. It helped me understand that I don't, where, where I fill in the gap as a provider. In the orthopedic setting, that was irrelevant when I was in the, a different country, in the hotel room with, you know, athletes trying to ask me in front of other athletes, hey, can I go this Saturday? That's a big question because if I answer that right in front of other athletes, 
they're already going to, you know, if this is a star player, I can't, I, I can't answer that. First of all, HIPAA. Number two, I got to talk to the coach first before I start saying anything. And so that's, that's a reality check for, for most people. Don't forget, even though they're athletes or not your friends, you're here to help them accomplish a goal. And you're, you're helping the team accomplish a goal. So as you get close to them, you're uh, in, in the hotel room, you're working on stuff, everybody's having a great time, there's music, they're watching TV. That's a great environment to be in. However, you gotta, you can't remember, you're a healthcare provider. You are a physical therapist ready to manage these individuals. And so you get close to the athletes. You spend more time with them. You're on an airplane, you're on a bus, you're in the dining hall. You spend more time, and because of that, you get closer. But nonetheless, you got to keep that, that uh, distance so that you can do your job more effectively and make more educated, logical decisions versus the emotional connection that you have with that person. So um, that was an interesting experience too. You know, you, you, your first time you're like, oh, it was it was great, you know, getting high fives, knuckles to all these athletes and you get connected with them. But that's not your job. Your job is to maintain that culture. Your job is to help them accomplish a goal. So don't forget that. If you make the wrong call, you can't get an athlete back to, you know, if they're a starter and you can't get them back to sport, you better believe you're probably not getting picked up. And it's truly like that. It's cutthroat in this sport. You might go on tour or to one event, and then you know what the coach is going to do? He's going to start asking all those athletes. He's going to ask the nutritionist. He's going to ask the whole team, hey, how did you think of that medical provider? Uh, you know, they were, um, they were a you know, six-week specialist. They, they couldn't manage it. They, could, they couldn't do acute care. They couldn't tape. Um, they couldn't uh, understand timelines. They didn't want to collaborate with us. And, uh, you know, they knew nothing about basic nutrition to be able to help out healing with, you know, uh, muscle injury. I don't think you need to be an expert, but what I do think you need is you got to be able to manage the whole spectrum. And at the very least, have some basic knowledge on that. And that's when you get to go on more tours is when you actually do it effectively and that the coach, so first and foremost, the athletes vouch for you. They're the people who are going to tell the coach and everybody else, you got to bring them back. They're great. Taping skills were great. Manual skills were great. Uh, you know, programming, exercise progression, and they took care of me. And that's what they want to hear. So uh, that was uh, that was the culture that was experienced. And that's working with a team. Now, when you're working with an individual, that is different. Ooh, uh, if you don't, if you have a, a partner, a significant other, a spouse, if you look at a 24 hour period, maybe you sleep in the same bed eight hours a night, right? And then you go to work for eight hours plus, you know, let's give an hour for commute. Uh, that's 10, uh, that's 18 hours. So you're actually with your partner for about six hours a day, right? And uh, and that's, you know, seven days a week or maybe the weekends you have, you know, a lot more time. However, rarely do you spend literally like 16 to 18 hours with one person weeks to months on end. And that is a different relationship. I have to admit that that is a different relationship. Uh, great experience, uh, nonetheless, but, um, you get to know somebody really, really quickly and there it's tempting to get to know them very closely but you're there to do a job. It's, I'm sure that's kind of like a bodyguard and, and protecting somebody, right? Like you, you get close to them, but you're not supposed to get close because your job is to protect them no matter what. And from a health perspective, that is your job. You're their bodyguard. You got to keep them healthy and that they're always going to look to you. And when you work as one individual going with them. So I served as the personal trainer, the, the strength coach, the nurse, <laughs> the nutritionist, the PT, the uh, PA, the you name it. I was kind of and massage therapist. I was all of that in one. Why? Because that's what they hired me for. And interestingly, in the culture of tennis or like one-on-one -on -one international travel, it's kind of the norm. So they call it physiotherapy, which is like all is all encompassing. You got to know basic meds. You got to know basic uh, GI problems. You got to know basic, uh, you know, what if somebody gets a headache? Uh, what's approved by the sport? What can what can and can't they do? They're going to have a physician that they consult with. But how does this affect their sleep? How does it affect their GI system? How does it affect their performance? That's what you have to know. It's side effects. What is this going to cause? Because the, who they're asking may not contribute to how that reflects in sport for that week. Can they take it pre-comp? Can they take it in competition? After competition? What if they compete in two days? How's that going to affect them? Right. So all these little layers are the things that you get to learn and you're like, I've never thought of that. All right, so for instance, uh, we when we went onto an airplane, what if somebody gets like 
a headache or um, they don't feel good, uh, you know, on the airplane. Uh, what what type of like what would they take? Should what should what, who who should they contact? What about did you ever think about this? I mean, like in 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, uh, there was less of a concern for um, airborne exposure. So we would be there and we realized, wait a minute, if we went on an airplane with 130 other people, can that get them sick right before an event? If their event is in seven days, oh, you're in a tough timeline. So we would just give load them up on an emergency or whatever it is, any immune system booster during that. And, and I literally had hand sanitizer all the time. They had their individual packs of hand sanitizer, immune system boosts. And ultimately, why? Because some of these guys are 18 to 24 years old. They can care less. They're, you know, they they're high in the sky. They don't, con they're not concerned about their immune system. They're there to play. But ultimately, you're their bodyguard. So what do you have to do? You have to carry around everything with them, so that way you can take care of them. Literally before the airplane shot, everybody take your immune system boost, whatever that is. Uh, you know, hand sanitizers all the way, all the way around. Wash your hands. Blah blah blah. I mean, you're just literally like a coach for health. <laughs> and so. That was on the airplane, and, and those are the things, the considerations we had. So, uh, how do we boost their immune system before they depart, while they're in the air, and then afterwards? And then, that's on the airplane. What about the day you arrive? What do you do? I mean, do you just let them sit down? What if it's a, a, a red eye? Well, you better believe that you have, you, you got to get them moving the next morning. So, if they're in a red eye, and we got there at 7 a.m., do we let them go to sleep? No. Absolutely not, especially if they compete at a certain time. We would always schedule the practice at the same time that they compete. So if they compete at 7 p.m., that's when we were practicing. So we'd do a morning session and an evening session. The evening session was there to prime their like nervous system, so what's about to hit in the next couple of days. And then, so once you arrive, you got to make sure that they're continuing to move. So if you get there at 7, 8 in the morning, everybody's sluggish. Nope, everybody's in the pool. So we go to the hotel room, let them know that we're coming, plan it ahead of time. We want to rent that pool out. And we had the pool. It was, you know, whatever, how many lanes. So for rugby, we had, you know, you know, 14, 15 guys in a pool. And then it was led by either the strength coach. If you're, if you're, if not, you're getting that remote program. You're leading them down the line. So there's no way you're being sluggish. You are moving and grooving. So... Uh, why? Because you don't want their circadian rhythms, you don't want them to be sleeping midday if it's going to mess up everything else down the line. Now, a consideration, I'll come back to that, but the consideration also was if we had an event that was five to seven days out, when do you fly in strategically? When do you fly in? One day out, two days out, three days out, one day before the event, three days before the event, how long are you going to stay there? If we were flying for the Paralympics, which was in London in 2012, we, we flew there, I think, four weeks early. Why? To get acclimated. Why is this important? Because not only do they need to get acclimated to the new time zone, uh, just to circadian rhythms, but their skin and sweat, they got to get used to that new humidity. Uh, if their altitude, they got to get used to that. So the acclimation is critical. So from a sweating standpoint to a nervous system test standpoint to a circadian rhythm standpoint, when are you flying out? Now, if it's just a weekend tournament, we know that it would take five to seven days to establish and use that circadian rhythm. So what we would do is we only fly in two days before, three days before, if it was just a weekend tournament and it was a, um, you know, East Coast tournament, and we were only doing a, a small time zone gap, then we'd fly in, you know, two days before, uh, keep the circadian rhythm, be able to compete so that way it, their nervous system doesn't get hit as hard. So by the time they compete, we're out, we leave, come back the next day, and it was just a small shock versus a large one. So if we were going to stay there for, you know, up to two weeks, you better believe we were there five to seven days earlier to, before they compete so that way they were prepped. Now, um, Going back to, you know, what do you do on the day that you arrive? Uh, the day you arrive, you're doing a pull workout, get them ready to rock and roll, uh, uh, get them acclimated to the circadian rhythm, to the time zones, uh, so that the digestive system is uh, normal, uh, that they can eat during the new lunch hour that they're going to have, set their new morning breakfast. And, and all this was pre-planned. Like we already knew we're going into a new time zone. Here's the altitude. 
uh, and here's the temperature. It's going to be colder. It's going to be you know muggy. Whatever it is, we had to acclimate for that. So you have you got to be prepped with waters. Are you doing Gatorade? Are you doing Powerade? What's the sodium ratio? What what are you doing? Do you need more salt? Is is this a thing? Uh, what's the coach's standard? What does a nutritionist say? All these factors, and you're like, I'm just a physical therapist. I'm trying to figure out how to fix their you know their injuries. The reality is, if you can do all this behind the scenes. It's a lower risk of injury, and that's the wizardry. Like that—that's a word, wizard, wi- wizardry. Uh, that's where you make the most bang for your buck. And I tell my team this all the time: the injury, injury is too late, and we are a too late uh, organization or profession. We're like a too late, uh, literally. By the time they get a, get to us, I think about it. Most people in orthopedic setting, they've had back pain for years. They, you know, shoulder pain for this, neck pain for this, and it took six to eight weeks. They, you know, got fed up at three months. They finally saw their primary care. The primary care, they, they tried massage. They tried, you know, uh, radiographs. They went to a local place. Like, there's all this stuff, right? By the time you see us, it's too late. It's going to take you double that to get them out. So if it took three months, that's my general rule. If it took them three months to get in pain, it's going to take me six months to get them out completely unless they're very active and they have a short timeline, they will always be in pain. So uh, there's a lot of caveats to that. But nonetheless, when you are managing people's pain or you're managing, by the time they get to you, too late. But if you're managing the season, now you have the ability to prevent or minimize or mitigate. I know that word for some people sensitive. You'll never prevent. Okay, whatever. It's all uh, uh, semantics. But I want to reduce the risk of injury. So how do I do that? By managing all these other variables, you know, making sure that they're well nourished, hydrated, uh, their sleep is good, uh, that protein in, and protein intake is high, the warm up is solid. Uh, Strength coach has a program in season to keep them strong and reduce their muscle mass. Or sorry, to avoid reducing the muscle mass so they can have the same amount of output. Now, if they have less muscle mass, you better believe that's a higher risk of injury. And from there. Then if you did some preventative um, uh, assessment, movement quality, uh, joint mo- uh, work, uh, just a general assessment of what they look like, if you do all those other variables and you attack their mobility and everything else, that's perfect. That sets you up for more success. But think about this. If they're dehydrated, uh, they're not ta- having high protein intake, they're not sleeping, uh, they're losing weight, What's that recipe for? Disaster. Absolute disaster. Poor performance. You're going to get fired. Why? Because their, your, their performance is a reflection of you. So if an athlete is doing well, you better believe the other athletes watching them are like, who's the physio? Who's who's the team behind that? Because I want them on my team. That's literally, they, it was like, yeah, it was so funny. It was just like watching uh, other athletes. They would, uh, uh, this was like tennis. They, they would watch uh, you know, me work on him or whatever it is. And other physios would be working. All these athletes are scoping. They're like, Oh, I like his techniques. I like her techniques. I like, and it's funny. You're, you're literally like on an interview and they're like, I, I'm, I thought I'm with you. And they're like, no, they, they are always looking for uh, a new physio. And it was pretty impressive to see, but you're literally on a job interview every single day and you can be fired instantly. Um, my wife asked me about this. She's like, what, was there a difference between, um, you know, uh, if you if you won a tournament or you you didn't, and uh, it was an emotional roller coaster. Uh, yes, in the world of rugby, we had a full schedule, right? So we we knew we were flying to New Zealand, and then in a couple months we were gonna fly to Australia, and from there we're gonna fly back to U.S. and then we're gonna go to Vegas. Like that whole map is set up. In the world of tennis, it is the opposite. You have a general outline of what you're gonna be, but if you get if you get beat and you lose, you're on to you could literally uh, forecast, hey, we're going to be in this hotel for five days because we have the French Open on Saturday. Um, and then I didn't want to ask, well, what happened Sunday? We just knew until Saturday. Why? Because the first time I didn't realize, I'm like, how do we not have a hotel tomorrow? Because it was based on how we were going to perform on Saturday. So we have the hotel, reserve it for then. And then I remember my wife asking me like, hey, so what, where are you going to be on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday? Where am I going to call? Are you going to be in Europe? Are you going to be in the U.S.? Where, where are you at? And it's like, I don't know. I'm just going to go with the flow. I, I They're not telling me much. So we go Monday through Friday. Saturday, if we won, you better believe we got the hotel for one more night. And then if we if we lost on Sunday, we could literally say, hey, grab your bags. We're going to Austria. There's a separate tournament. Um, you know, this one's going to continue going on. We're on to Austria. I'm like, 
oh, okay, sounds good. <laughs> Let me pack my bags. So you just got to be flexible. And if you think you're adaptable now, when you're on somebody else's like time, dime, all of the above, you better believe whatever they say goes. And sometimes that's an emotional roller coaster for a lot of people for both parties. But that means that you, the medical provider, have to be the most stable in that relationship because ultimately, sometimes you do all the work that you could possibly do and then their performance wasn't just to par. Like they just had a bad day, like their swing was off or they couldn't, you know, uh, pass the ball right or whatever. We all have those days. And sometimes you do everything and you, you couldn't help it. And that's frustrating. And all you can do is just be the solid rock. So in addition to being a massage therapist, PT, nutritionist, uh, dietitian, uh, PA, nurse, you're also a sports psychologist uh, while you travel. You're just all of the above. And coolest experience, but the most pressure possible because you're like, I don't even know. Then you start thinking about, well, how do I... I mean, are there techniques to sports psych? I mean, then you start diving into like doing more research and like, how do I maintain energy high? What do I need to do pre-comp? Do I bring them up too high? Do I bring them up lower? Do I not Do I not talk to them pre, pre-competition? pre Everything's based on the athlete. But ultimately, you got to find a way to bring them up and keep them up. You can't push them too high because then they just, they crash. So they go through emotional roller coaster. And so you are the rock and uh, you got to, you got to learn some basics on sports psych, believe it or not, it is uh, essential. So uh, when you are with an individual, you, you could better believe you'd be in a different time zone in 24 hours, not even know it. So we would reserve hotels for three nights. That's it. Not knowing where we're going to go. We have a general idea. We might fly back to North Carolina. We might fly to Georgia. We might fly to Egypt. I don't know, but here's the general timeline. And so that's why my wife, when she was um, calling me, I'd be like, I don't know where we're going to go tomorrow. We might be in Italy tomorrow. I have no idea. And that was a cool thing. But uh, as a if if you're kind of like me in OCD, you like to know, you know, you're organized and want to know what's what's next. Uh, it's hard. It's hard on the psyche, but um, it's a new opportunity. So uh, what does it mean when you win or lose? Oh, the 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 bouncing of emotions. And uh, you got to learn some basics on sports psych. We talked about the daily schedule, uh, practice versus pre-comp versus comp. Uh, just to add to that, I think that when you're in uh uh, when you're like multiple days out, probably more than 72 hours out from a comp, I would say that's kind of like off season. And then two days before the event, two, three days before the event, that's kind of preseason. And then you're in competition that day. And so, uh, you, you kind of have to treat it as such. So you can only be aggressive from a treatment perspective, maybe Monday, Tuesday at the worst case Wednesday. Why? Because they get sore. They, if you want to do some aggressive treatment, you know, like, you know, hips are stiff, low back is stiff, thoracic spine, neck, whatever it is. You, you can't be too aggressive close to the competition, so you're going to have to map that out. When would I be uh, more aggressive? Probably Monday or Tuesday. Uh, Wednesday is recovery day. You have them in the pool. They're in Normatec. Uh, you're doing soft tissue, just normal stretch. On Thursday is a uh, high volume uh, in the actual weight room. It's a high-intensity practice, so we'll leave that day alone. We're not going to be doing anything aggressive. Friday is a stretch day, soft tissue, blood flow, and get them ready. They're just doing a walkthrough, not high contact, whatever it is. And then Saturday is the comp. Before, Saturday on the comp, I mean, you're up at four or five in the morning, just mapping out what can go wrong today. What do I need to do? Do we have the taxi set up? Uh, you know, do I have the keys to the to the apartment, what, a hotel? Are they going to have food? Uh, what time are they, what time does breakfast start? If we have a competition at nine and they don't have breakfast till eight, it's too close. We need to be in taxi by six thirty a.m. Where are we going to get breakfast? These are the things that you're mapping out, and you're like, this is everything but being a physical therapist. However, it is being true healthcare provider and be able to see the spectrum of how do I help this person perform at their best versus how do I get them out of pain? Big difference, big difference. And actually, this is a bold statement, but getting them out of pain was probably the least of my concerns. Keeping them away from more pain was probably a, a better way to see it. But I knew in competition, we, we were, if we're talking about pro tennis, there was definitely seasons. And when we were in season in Europe, we're practicing five days a week, six days a week, competing the other two, probably five, six weeks in a row. There's no off time. There's zero off time. You better believe you have one ankle sprain. It sets up this whole cascade of problems. So what's the best thing? Set them up for success and, you know, have them in, in ankle braces, ankle strengthening, whatever it is. And that's why when people say, Chris, do you, do you, are you a fan of bracing and taping? Absolutely. For which case? Off season, in season, 
peak season, day of competition? I can't give absolute answers like that. And that's the hardest part. I hear people like, oh, taping doesn't work. For who? For a, a nine-year nine chronic back pain? I, I could see that. But if you're seeing people who are competitive, training, have a timeline, and, you know, motivated, you better believe I'm going to do that. Why? Because it helps. It helps reduce, you know, uh, you know, swelling. It helps, you know, improve their confidence. I throw a taping, brace, you, you name it, everything, the whole kitchen sink. Why? Because if I compete in three days, you better believe if that was my ankle, I'll do it. We posed this question to uh, one of our team members. Uh, they asked me a complex case, and I was like, you know, they said, um, what, what should I do? And I said, if this was you or your daughter or your son or your family member or your partner, what would you do? And I think that when you see it that way, it's easier to make a, a good answer. Why? Because you, you take, your, take your darn clinician lens off. Because I think we get so wrapped up in the, you know, the, the, the science says this and, you know, um, my mentor told me, I don't care what's in the best interest of this human. You got to know that. Yeah. So blend the art and your history and experience and put that together into does this feel right for that person? You got to blend the two. And then ultimately, is this the right thing for that person? And easy way to answer it. If it was you, would you do it? I bet a lot of your treatment style would change if you uh, asked yourself that. If this was me, what would I do? Then treat him as such. Easy answer. So uh, my, that was my answer, literally. Would you do it? And then uh, compare that with what's currently you know, evidence-based. And then what have you learned from the past? And then is it right for you? I don't know. Uh, you got to be able to answer that. Uh, I don't have uh, the answer. I just have better questions for you to think better. All right. Uh, so traveling. So this was behind the scenes. Uh, we talked about, you know, what it, what do you travel with? Um, daily practices, uh, practice schedule versus pre-comp versus competition. Uh, what happens when you, if you win or lose, uh, determines the next day. You got to be flexible. Uh, traveling with an individual versus a team is very, very different. And, uh, you know, what is my favorite? Oof. How... Both are amazing for different reasons. If you, I wouldn't start by traveling with one person. You don't know enough yet. I don't care what your background is. Even if you 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 were you know you worked with uh, athlete, you worked as an athletic trainer for um, a high caliber um, college um, D1 university. You became a PT. You did a sports residency. You did a sports fellowship. You you still got to get your feet wet with traveling. Traveling is a different beast. Traveling is. Uh, you kind of have a, you put your experience and then you got to learn a little bit along the way and all your experiences should minimize how many mistakes you're making throughout that process. Uh, but you, you need a lot underneath your belt. Uh, if not, you're, you better be learning quickly. That's my advice. Uh, if not, you'll be coming back to your, uh, your cozy bed very quickly because you will no longer have a position <laughs> and uh, nobody wants that. Uh, I did it for about a total of, I think, five years four or five years now no five, five or six maybe uh and um why did i stop i actually really loved it um i earned uh some good contracts and and the ability to travel more and uh it was just the time uh, in our life and my wife and i decided that it was the in the best interest for us we wanted to settle down we wanted to have our first uh, uh kid and that was zach and uh it was worth every single um uh, opportunity and it was a, the best decision for us uh, because it was at a time that we were starting sports performance and if you've heard that podcast before uh, we had to have a big debate on what was the next step for us uh, and me saying no to a very lucrative uh, position in professional uh, basketball and um, uh, that would la- that would have led me to travel more and uh, who is it for traveling is for the flexible adaptable person who absolutely loves acute care management uh, learning how to fill the gaps and one who can let their ego go because when you're working with a pro athlete they don't care about necessarily like what you what skill set you have is what you can do for them it's a very different world when you work in an orthopedic clinic you're you're like you're very focused on skill set right how do I uh, mobilize this how do I stretch this how do I um, strengthen this very isolated and in the traveling world, pro sports world, high le- high caliber athletes world, it's not what skill set you can do, it's how can you fill the gap with doing it all. If the athletic trainer, you know, calls out for the day they're sick, can you fill that gap? If the strength coach is unable to travel, can you fill that gap? If the coach is not present today, 
can you fill the gap with a warm-up and a basic session and let the captain take over? That's what you're looking for. That's the person who can fill the gap. That's the adaptable one. And that's a person who has zero ego and is like, I'm kind of like the, you know, malleable, tell me where to go type of a person, but I'm going to come in with confidence and I will adapt to the situation. That's who it's for. It's not for the person who is uh, OCD, uh, I'm only a PT, and I only do these things, and I don't do this. Uh, that will get you very little contracts and very little experience. So uh, I hope you uh, enjoy this. This was a question posed by uh, a team member, uh, a client, and my wife and I were discussing it um, all at the same time. And so I wanted to share, and uh, at different times of your career, you might have an opportunity or you just literally um, want to learn more about how to advance that. And if this is something for you, I highly encourage you, come over to my retreats. Uh, my first one this year is um, March 12th and 13th in San Diego. Uh, this is 2022, whenever you're listening to this. Uh, my first one is in uh, San Diego. It's our new sports performance location, just five minutes north of the airport. Uh, it's not a, it's not like a CEU course, I promise you. It's literally a retreat. Like, have some coffee with me. I'll provide it to everybody. Um, I'll go through cases. We'll solve them together. Uh, you know, afterwards, uh, hang out, um, network. Uh, meet me, meet everybody else who is just like you, uh, talk about cases, talk about potential in the profession, like whatever it is. And so if you're looking for an opportunity to, you know, meet other people and become a sports specialist or become a sports expert or just become more familiar with sports physical therapy, but you're tired of like the same, like, you know, uh, I, I, you have to go through this meeting and you have to go through this channel and maybe the residency or fellowship is not for you or maybe you've done that and you want more. Um, maybe you're just looking for different opportunities. Uh, I would say this is the perfect opportunity for you. It's for somebody who's looking for something different. They're tired of, you know, the same stuff, um, the same courses that are being held and uh, they're looking for like more practical hands-on experience and uh, for more of the intuition and art uh, style of treatment. And that's what I'm going to be able to uh, offer. So if that's for you, join in. Uh, I am, uh, go ahead and jump on my email list, drchrisgarcia.com forward slash mailing dash list. Uh, if you need any help, if you just literally want to ask if if this is the best thing for you right now, or you want to take my second one in the summer, uh, that's fine too. Go ahead and e email me, Dr. Chris at drchrisgarcia.com, and I'll get back to you, or if not, one of my team will. Uh, but ultimately, this is all here to help you along your professional career, and there's going to be times where, uh, you know, you have opportunities, and, uh, you know, they're exciting, and you just got to know uh, what to expect when you get there. So I hope this helps, and uh, enjoy your safe travels if you are. Uh, get the cheapest table, or sorry, the lightest table possible, not just the cheapest. All right. All right, take care, guys. Uh, enjoy. Hope you enjoyed the episode.